Well, good morning and welcome to Compass Christian Church where our mission is navigating people to God. My name is Shannon, like Nathan said, and I'm one of the student pastors at our Colleyville campus. And I'm so excited to be here at our Roanoke campus this morning. My family loves this Roanoke campus and my husband, Rob, he has preached here a few times and you might remember him. He's kind of buff and he's quite the silver fox. And he's the one who had to wear a brace because he chopped off his, or not chopped off, tried to chop off his hand with a machete and he also like broke his bicep baptizing someone one time so he's been here with like a brace so I don't know if that rings a bell but and then our daughter Kate she gets to lead worship out here sometimes so they come out here and I always want to be able to do that so I'm excited to be here with you guys today um, my we have a son named Garrett who goes to school in Longview and then this past summer we got to add a sweet beautiful daughter in love to our family and her name is Rachel isn't she beautiful? She's so pretty and we love her so much. So we are glad that you're here with us today. And I want to welcome those of you if you're watching online and if you're new to Compass, we are just honored that you would come and worship with us today. And like Nathan said, we're continuing with our Dark Horse series and we have two more weeks. And then we'll have that decision Sunday and, and Thursday that he talked about. And so I just want to encourage you as God is talking through his word today, just to be open to maybe what he is saying to you right now. And we've defined a dark horse, in case you haven't been here with us, as, some, a, as a little known person, unlikely to succeed, who ultimately accomplishes great things. And there's just something about all of us that loves a dark horse, dark horse story, right? Like, wouldn't we love to do amazing and brave things in our own lives? I think you're going to love this story because it's about a young girl who really understood her mission. And I think she would have loved our church. She missed our church by about 2,500 years, but I think she would have loved it because our mission is navigating people to God. And she was an incredibly brave woman who was willing to give her life for her mission and for God. Her name is Esther. And I'm super visual, and so I have chosen some slides to help us keep track of the different people in this book of the Bible. It's so awesome, like really and truly buckle up because it's so much, but it's so good. But it, I have to really have a mental picture of everybody to go with it. So Esther, I've chosen Gal Gadot because she really was, a, like she really is Israeli, and she's Wonder Woman. So I'm like, yeah, she's perfect. And she has an entire book of the Bible in the Old Testament named after her. It's relatively a short book. And so you could go back and read it. I honestly encourage you to read it because I'm kind of, I'm going to fly through it. Everything I tell you today is truly what happened and in the order, hopefully, that it is in, in the Bible. And so then if later you're like, that did not happen, feel free to go back and check. Um, it really is like a movie almost. It has everything in it. So you've got um, assassination plots and big wild drunken parties. You've got drama and suspense and murder. So we're going to have a little bit of everything. And it's so action-packed that we're going to divide it up into scenes. And I'm going to call scene one, The Hangover. And you'll understand why in just a minute. So the scene opens with King Xerxes. And King Xerxes he was this king over Persia, which would be like modern day Iran back in 470 BC. And he was one of the most powerful men in the world at that time. And he ruled over 127 different provinces, including the Israelites or the Jewish people. And then in chapter one, he decided that he wanted to show off all of his power and his possession. And so he invited all of his royal officials and different people into his palace to celebrate for six months. They had a banquet for six months. I, I like can't even imagine that. I look back at the wedding that we had this past year and we had engagement parties and showers and rehearsals and dinners and the ceremony and, you know, family coming to town and all of that. And really, if, if you add it all up, the amount of time we probably celebrated was a week to, at most. So we're talking six months of partying. And then at the end of that, he invites all the normal people to this kegger. And he says, and this is in the Bible, 
And by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. The king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished, Esther 1, verse 8. And some of you are like, let's preach that sermon next week. But <laughs> King Xerxes himself also was feeling really, really good. And towards the end of the banquet, he decided that he wanted to show off his greatest possession, his wife, Queen Vashti. And Queen Vashti was drop dead gorgeous. She was just so beautiful. And the king thought, I want everyone to see her. In fact, I want her to come perform a little Super Bowl halftime J-Lo Shakira show for my friends. And she really, really, I mean, he, that's really primarily what he wanted. And Queen Vashti replied, are you kidding me? No way. And so unfortunately for her, that embarrassed King Xerxes and he was livid. And so he said, you know what? Fine. You're not the queen anymore. And he divorced her and took away her crown like on the spot. So we are going to enter scene two and we're going to call that The Bachelor. The officials rounded up teenage girls from all over all of his area and all of his uh, people. And I know it's hard to believe that there was once a culture that was so superficial that middle-aged men would try to show off to other people that they had wealth and power enough to attract a wife of youth and beauty. But once upon a time, there was a, such a superficial culture. Anyway, I don't care who you are, that's funny. And um, they brought in 127 girls, and Esther was one of them. So she was just an ordinary Jewish girl, probably between the ages of 14 and 17, which I realize is glamorized sex trafficking, but that is what happened historically. And she was beautiful. Her parents had passed away, and so she had been raised by her cousin, Mordecai. He had taken her in, was like a father to her. And Mordecai was of Jewish heritage also, and he was a really, really wise man. And he would give Esther advice, and he would help her as she was going through this, like, pageant, this beauty pageant. And he told her, do not tell anyone at all that you are Jewish or that I am your cousin. He was like, don't let anybody know that because the Persian people did not like the Jewish people. And Mordecai was aware of this. So Esther quickly takes the lead in this pageant and she becomes one of the finalists. And before she and the other finalists could go before King Xerxes, they had to go through 12 months of beauty treatments. And again, this is in the Bible. I do not know what it means exactly. I have wondered, I've been driving down the street and I've thought, what did they look like after 12 months of beauty treatments? Like I've wondered, was it a real life Snapchat filter or something? Cause I'm in for that, especially I'm older than 14 to 17 and I'm like, I'm down. So anyway, ladies in here, how many of you have ever gotten ready for, not, well, I'm not even talking about your own wedding, but any wedding where you had to spend like over an hour getting ready? Anybody? Christmas party, something like that. Yeah. You've got, and in this area, like you have to get your nails done. You have to get your hair done. You have to get your toes done. You have to buy the dress. I'm super, super pale. So you have to do a spray tan. I mean, it's a big deal to get ready for stuff. And it, you know, so it took them this time. And guys, the next time your wife or your girlfriend makes you wait a little while while they're getting ready, like have some grace and go, you know what? It's not 12 months. So, you know, tuck that away and be nice there. Anyway, um, my husband in particular, remember that. Um, there is a lot of pressure for this first day. And if somebody's not attracted to you after 12 months, like you're going to feel pretty bad about yourself, right? But the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and he made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials. And he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and he distributed gifts with royal liberality or generosity. So Xerxes loves his banquets. And even after she won, Esther remembered what Mordecai had told her and he did, she did not tell King Xerxes that she was Jewish or that Mordecai was her cousin. And that's gonna bring us to scene three, we're going to call it Patriot Games. So Mordecai was one of the king's officials. 
And he would stay at the king's gate and he would keep track of things and he had different things that he would offer for the king. But by being at the king's gate, he also was able to get messages to Esther and to kind of keep track of her and make sure she was doing okay. And one day he was sitting by the gate and he overheard some of the king's guards talking about a plot to assassinate King Xerxes. So he sent word to Esther and he said, Esther, you need to tell King Xerxes that some of his guards are planning on assassinating him. And Esther went to the king and she let him know. And she told him that Mordecai had told her about this. And the assassins were like their plan was thwarted and they actually ended up being executed themselves. So Mordecai kind of saved the day and the king's um, notary or secretary or whatever wrote that down in the chronicles, but really nothing was ever done for Mordecai. I want to invite you to tuck that away for later on. So the king had another royal official and his name was Haman. And Haman was a really bad guy. And he was an egomaniac. He was not a good man. And for whatever reason, King Xerxes he promoted Haman to his second in command. And he also issued like this edict that anybody who passed Haman or anybody whom Haman passed had to bow down before him. And so everybody would bow down to him because this is what the king says, except for Mordecai, because Mordecai was this godly Jewish man. And he was like, I will not bow down to any man. I only bow down to Yahweh, God. And this made Haman furious. This like made him so mad. And Haman was like, I'm so mad about this. I just want to kill him. And it, he was like so obsessed with himself. So he decides, you know what? It's not even enough to kill Mordecai. I'm going to kill his whole family. And so Haman goes to King Xerxes. He offers him a huge bribe. And he says, hey, would you be willing to let me kill. There's this group of people, they're not good. I think we need to wipe them out. Can we kill all these people? And King Xerxes, he trusts Haman. He's like, you know what, keep your money, that's fine. I'll give you my royal seal, whatever you need to do, just take them out. And he has no idea at this point that he has just sealed the fate of his wife, Esther. Because again, he doesn't know that she's Jewish at this point. And so Mordecai learned about this and he was grief stricken and terrified for the three to 400,000 people, the Jewish people who were living in Persia at that time. I mean, we're talking World War II, Nazi Germany here. And so Mordecai is so upset and he goes and he sends a message to Esther. And he says, Esther, you've got to go before the king and you've got to beg him to spare our lives. And at this point, it had been some time since Esther and King Xerxes had gotten married. And Esther was herself terrified, which I can't even imagine. Like, we're talking about a really young girl. And I'm, like I said, I'm older than 14 to 17. And I would be terrified to go before a king. And the one thing that we have to know, too, is that in the Bible, it says that King Xerxes would kill you on the spot. If you entered his court and you had not been invited... He would kill you unless he held out his gold scepter to you. And Esther's thinking, I don't know if he's going to hold out his gold scepter to me. In fact, she sends word back to Mordecai and she says, the king has not asked me to come see him in 30 days. And so it's been over a month and she's thinking, I don't know that the king still likes me as much as he liked me when we first got married. And so she's not even sure that he would listen to her. And she's thinking he could kill me if I go to see him. So she tells that to Mordecai. And the Bible says that when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And I do want to point out that in this Bible, this is in this, in this book of the Bible, it's the only book of the Bible that never mentions God's name. But God is present. And Mordecai is telling Esther this right now. And it's one of my very favorite verses in the Bible in fact, it's written in huge letters on a chalkboard in our kitchen at, right now. 
to remind me and to remind our family that God has us where we are right this minute for a reason. And it's important for all of us to know whether we're single or married or students or whether we're parents or we're at work or at school, young or old, God can use us where we are and he has a plan for each of our lives. We were created for such a time as this. You were created for such a time as this. And maybe you're going through a really hard time right now at work or at school or at home, or maybe you feel like it's not a good time for God to do something like big in your life. It's just not like the best timing. Or maybe you're going through a season of loss or illness or loneliness or grieving, or maybe you have no idea what is next in your life. But you can know this, is that God has a plan for where you are and he's put you where you are for such a time as this. And Esther, she had a choice between bravery or comfort. She could save herself or she could save her people. And we have that choice too. We may not face death every day like Esther, but we have a choice wherever we go, whether we're at the, in the break room at work or in the lunchroom at school or in the locker room. We have a choice to where we could stand up for God and other people. And we also, like, if you're in college and people are going out on the weekend, you can stand up for God and say, I'm gonna live my life for the Lord. And it may mean standing up in front of people here at church in a couple of weeks when there's that decision weekend and saying, I wanna make God the Lord of my life, the ruler of my life. I wanna give my life to him. And that's scary. It is, it's scary, but it's, it's so important. And it's something that God has for all of us. He has a bigger plan for us, just like he had for Esther. When I was about Esther's age, I um, wanted to pursue a career in modeling because when I was growing up, I was always the tallest student in my class. Like, not just the tallest girl, I was taller than all the boys. Every single year from kindergarten through sixth grade, if, how many of you ever stood on the stage in the cafeteria where you had to take group pictures? Did anybody ever do that? Anybody? Like a few people? Okay, thank you. I'm like, wow, man, I'm the oldest person in here. Okay, so we would stand there, and I was always that tall person. A lot of times I was taller than the teacher, and I also was like really skinny and awkward, and so my features were too big for my face. And you know, kids at that age are really, really nice. And so I had the nickname Too Tall and Fish Face because my eyes were so big and my lips were so big. And back then I didn't know that someday people would pay to have big lips, but I was embarrassed. And so I would sit in class and I would try and make my eyes smaller and my lips smaller. I would like literally chew on my lips and I have bumps inside my mouth because I just wanted to be like everybody else. I didn't want to be different and I just wanted people to like me. So when I was in high school and somebody approached me about modeling, I was like, okay, this is something I could do even though I'm tall and skinny. And because my basketball career was not working out for me, okay? I don't know if you can tell, I'm not like super athletic, but I was like, okay, I could do this and there would be people who were kind of like me. And I went to Japan when I was like 15 years old. And I lived with some girls who were like just barely older than I was. And they were really, really wild. And we weren't really friends because we were all in competition with each other for jobs, but they were the only people that I knew. And I was 15 years old. And remember, I just wanted to be liked and I just wanted to be like everybody else. And so I would go out with these girls and I made really bad decisions. And honestly, I know like it sounds mod like modeling would be this super glamorous thing, but it wasn't for me. It was one of the most lonely and darkest seasons in my entire life. And so when I came back to the States, I was approached by my youth minister and I had met him just a little bit before I'd gone to Japan. And my youth minister, he invited me to come to church and he invited me to go to youth group and he invited me to go to church camp and he loved me. I mean, he knew what I was. I mean, I was very wild and it was very obvious, but he just loved me where I was and he encouraged me and I grew in my relationship with the Lord and I got baptized and I gave my life to him and God worked in my life and he helped me know that I had more to offer than just like what was on the outside. I, what was more important was what was on the inside of my life. And um, my youth minister later on, he said, you know what, I think that you could, like you'd be a good youth minister someday. 
And truly, at that time, there, as far as I know or knew, there were no female youth ministers. Like, that wasn't a thing. But he was like, you could use your life to help other girls who just want to be liked and who just want to fit in and girls who've been objectified and you could, you know, encourage them and be there for them. And you could tell other students about Jesus and what he's done in your life. And so I went to Bible college and I got a degree in elementary education and a Bible degree. And then after my sophomore year of college, he hired me to be a youth intern at our church and he let me work with students. And I have been working with students, either volunteer or on staff, for the, like my entire adult life. I've been working with students. And that was all because one person looked at me where I was and just encouraged me and reached out to me. Just like Mordecai reached out to Esther, which is going to bring us to scene four. And we're going to call this Die Hard. So Esther sent word to Mordecai, and she asked all the Jewish people to fast and pray with her for three days. And fasting and praying is powerful. It's really, really powerful. And it reminds us that we don't need anything except God. He is in control and not us. And it's not comfortable to fast and pray. And sometimes for me, like I'm super, super social. And so sometimes I'm like, I just wish God could like talk back to me. So I'll drive around in my car and I just talk to him like I'm on my cell phone. And anyway, if people don't know, and I can just talk out loud, but even if it's hard, sometimes it's powerful and it's important. And so Esther at this young age, totally got that. And she committed to fasting and praying. And she said, if y'all will fast and pray with me, then in three days, I will go before the king. And then she said in Esther 4, 16, if I perish, I perish. She's like, if I die, I die but I will do this. So incredibly brave. And she didn't put it off. She set a time, she prayed and she fasted and then she acted. And I wanna build off that moment in our own lives because we all have like an if then statement. If, you know, she said, if I die, I die. Well, for us, I want us to think about what is the greatest fear that you have right this minute? If you were to say, if blank, then blank. So if we look at that if blank, if we have to go into debt, if we can't pay our bills, if my parents get divorced, if I never meet someone, if nobody likes me, if I don't get that scholarship or I don't get into that school or if we can't pay for college or if I don't like pass this test, what if I never graduate? What if I lose my job? We all have those right now. And the enemy wants us to focus on that fear. And he wants us to believe that if blank happens, that it's all over and we're finished and we're beyond recovery. But we need to fill in the second blank first. And we need to say, if blank, then God. So if whatever happens, if we fill in with God first, if my worst fear comes to pass, then God. God is big. God is big enough for us and he will pick us up and he will be our strength and he will get us through whatever it is that we're facing right now. And he will do whatever he says because he is bigger than our fear blank. And God is with every single one of us right now, just like he was with Esther. And so Esther at this time, she goes ahead and she goes before King Xerxes and King Xerxes, he holds out his scepter to her. And she goes before him and she says, King Xerxes, I would like to invite you to come to a banquet at my house today. And so King Xerxes says, okay, I'll come to your house today. And then he invites Haman to come too. And Haman's like, yeah, I get invited to the queen's house. And so they go over to Queen Esther's house and they have this banquet, you know, and then the king says, okay, I will give you up to half of my kingdom and just tell me whatever your request is. And so Esther says, you know, what I'd really like to ask is, would you and Haman come back to my house tomorrow and I'll prepare another banquet for you and then I will give you my request. Now, Esther is really wise. She has prayed and she has fasted and that's powerful. And so God gave her this wisdom. She knows that King Xerxes loves banquets, right? So she invites him back and he's like, yeah, I will come back tomorrow. She says, and then I'll let you know. 
And so what happens is that they leave and Haman is like, he's feeling good. And he's like, I am awesome. And he wants everybody to know, like I went to the queen's house and so excited. And on his way home, he passes Mordecai and Mordecai does not bow down to him. And so Haman is like, oh, and he's so mad. He's like, I'm so mad. He's just ruining my whole day. And he just killed my buzz. And so he said, I want to kill him right now. And his friends and his wife say, you know what? Go to King Xerxes. Like, you're his right-hand man. Ask him if you can execute him tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I would totally do that. And then I can enjoy the banquet tomorrow, and I'll be done with Mordecai. It'll be awesome. And so he decides he's going to head over to see King Xerxes. Meanwhile, during this time, King Xerxes has gone home, and he's trying to get ready for bed, and he can't sleep. And he doesn't have like his Kindle or sleepy time tea or melatonin or whatever. And so he's like, what could help me fall asleep? And he calls in one of his people and he says, you know what? Read to me my chronicles, which is like board meeting minutes or something, right? And that will put you to sleep pretty fast. How God worked it out though, is that this, the minutes that he started reading or that they started reading to him was about where Mordecai had saved his life. And King Xerxes says, wait a minute, did anything ever happen for Mordecai whenever he saved my life? And they were like, no, nothing. we never did anything, but he, this did happen. And so, by the way, King Xerxes was later um, assassinated by some of his guards. This is in history books, not in the Bible, but this is how you can know the Bible is true because God tells us stuff that is like, it's real and historical and accurate. So anyway, I think that's awesome. But So he says, you know, we need to do something. And right at that moment, Haman walks in. And the king says to Haman before Haman can say anything, Haman, what should I do for someone that I want to honor? And Haman's like, well, who would the king want to honor more than me? And so Haman goes, you know what? I think you get your royal robe, you get your royal horse, and you have someone parade him around town and tell everybody and yell out, this is the one whom the king loves. And so King Xerxes is like, yeah, that's a great idea. Go do all that stuff, get all that stuff ready and do that for Mordecai. And Haman's like, well, Oh, he's so, he's so sad. So he can't execute Mordecai. He has to go out and tell everyone in the whole town that Mordecai is awesome. And when he gets finished, it's time for him to go to the banquet at Esther's house. So King Xerxes and Haman enter Esther's house and King Xerxes says, okay, Esther, I will give you all of like up to half my kingdom. Just let me know what it is that you want. And so Esther says, to the king, she says, um, I, King Xerxes, and this is in, uh, I'm so sorry, my thing messed up. This is in the Bible. Here's what she says. If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. And King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he, the man who would dare to do such a thing? And Esther said, an adversary and an enemy, this vile Haman. And so the king was furious. He was so, so mad that he had to leave the room. Like he's just livid. And Haman is like, oh my gosh, he's going to kill me. So he throws himself on Esther, begging her to spare his life. And at that exact moment, King Xerxes walks back in the room and he's like, what are you doing to my wife? So he's done. And he's like, you know what? Kill Haman right now. And they take Haman and they execute him in the same spot that Haman had built up where he was going to have Mordecai executed. So, I mean, that's amazing to me. And the way that God like works through his word, the Bible is powerful. And because one woman said no to a life of comfort and safety and security and wealth and said yes to following God, the Jews were saved and Mordecai became King Xerxes' right-hand man, and he was able to give the king wise advice. And we all have the opportunity to follow God to the point of giving our lives as well. 
Some of us are one brave decision away from making the most significant decision in our lives. Some of you are one brave decision away from making the most significant decision in your life. In fact, you can have a chance today to commit to things that you've been praying and fasting about for the past 21 days of prayer. Or we, like Esther, can all choose to be brave and make a decision that could change our lives and the lives of others. We can decide to raise our children to be godly men and women. We can support parents whose kids are younger than ours. We can volunteer in children's ministry and student ministry. They need volunteers. We can be a part of, um, we can go to Compass Academy and learn how we can serve our church. We can give our finances for God. And we can just start something and volunteer with something in our city. We can give our lives for God. And some of us, some of you need to decide, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna give my whole life and I want to be baptized. And so I wanna encourage you, if you have the little card that you received today, and if that's something that God is putting on your heart right now, and if he's saying, you know what, give it to me, I will take care of you, I am enough. I just wanna encourage you to fill that out. We just wanna be able to know and be prepared for you on that decision Sunday, because it's gonna be amazing. And it is awesome to stand up with other people who will support you and say, I give my life to God. And so you can fill that in. And if you wanna talk to another pastor and say, I need to know more about this, there's a place for you to check that as well. And there will be people at the doors in the back who will take those cards for you. Because who knows, but that God has brought you to this defining moment for such a time as this. Would you pray with me right now? God, I just thank you so much for every single person in this room. I thank you that you brought all of us here today and I thank you for your word that helps us to know that you are real and that you are trustworthy. And I thank you for the way that you speak to us through your word. And I just wanna ask Lord that you would speak to all of us today and that you would help us to not give in to fear, but that we would trust that no matter what, you are in control and you care about us and you see us and you know where we are and you will carry us through whatever happens. And so I just pray blessing and I pray Lord that you would help us to just know and understand how much you love us. We love you and we're so thankful to you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.